Uh, so my name's Mark Polizotto. I'm the head of the Therapeutics and Vaccine Research Program here at the Kirby, and it's a great pleasure to be chairing this really very diverse session uh, with Professor Janaki Amin, who many of you know from her years at the Kirby and who's now uh, a professor at uh, Macquarie University here in Sydney. I think one of the great pleasures for me as a clinician uh, and academic working with David was his ability to take those of us who worked at the bedside and who wanted to address the problems we saw at the bedside um, and to connect us to the larger structures that would, would help us do that work, whether that was the community organisations we've heard about, the political frameworks, the administrative structures. Um, and I think this session really encompasses a number of people who've, who illustrate those different dimensions of David's work, including a number of people who, of course, were mentored by him. Uh, we're starting uh, with Professor Linda Gale Becker, uh, who many of you will know as president of the International AIDS Society, uh, 2016 through 2018, um, from her role at the Desmond Tutu HIV Center, where she's a professor of medicine and deputy director. Uh, Linda's made many impressive co contributions uh, to the HIV response and worked alongside David through those years. And it, it's a great honor to welcome her to the podium now. Thank, Thank you so much. Great, and it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you so much to the Kirby Institute, Tony, many others uh, for this invitation. And I'm here predominantly wearing uh, my presidential hat. So um, I'm going to, I hope in the next 25, 20 odd minutes, um, just reflect on the, the fact that AIDS is still political. And I believe that David would agree with this and, and would have liked the tone of this talk. And so uh, my, my message is, dear Dave, as you know, AIDS was political in the beginning, and we've heard some elements of this this morning already. Uh, but I was struck by this statement that he made during a recent radio interview, uh, where he reflected on his Jewish heritage and, and said that at medical school, he felt different uh, and, and felt persecuted because of that. And he saw the same sort of thing in vulnerable populations that we in the HIV response have dealt with, who were on the edges of the community. So in the last 30 years, an amazing 78 million people have been infected with this virus. 39 of them, a million of them have died. And over these last 30 years, we've certainly seen exclusions, we've seen activism, we've seen inclusions. Uh, we've seen new global governance come about, political pressures be applied, travel bans in, in, in implemented, travel bans lifted, uh, new global funding coming about, uh, truly an unprecedented public health response. During that time, we have despaired, we've hoped, and some would have gone on to say, perhaps somewhat triumphantly, uh, that we, have, we are nearing the end of AIDS. At the International AIDS Society, we have been concerned that maybe this message is too soon, too much, uh, and, and, and preempts perhaps all the work that still remains to be done. Without doubt, we have come a long way. Uh, we heard again of some of these triumphs uh, during this morning. And certainly, most important of that, I believe, is the impact of antiretrovirals. With that surge of treatments uh, since the 2000s, and now, particularly on my continent, the amazing difference that has been made uh, to mortality as well as morbidity. And, and David spoke about this triumph of treatment. He said, the story of HIV is a modern medical miracle. From despair and tragedy, we have moved into an era of chronic treatable illness in just 30 years. But certainly, politics have also dogged that, that triumphant story. And, and you know, uh, South Africa was in, in uh, our conversations this morning. And, and that politics, I think, has, has really shaped, uh, particularly since 2000, how things have changed, and, and this notion of uh, a global world and access of treatment uh, to all. David served as president of the International AIDS Society from 94 to 98, 
During that time, he co-chaired the Vancouver International AIDS Conference in 1996, which really ushered in that new era of treatment bringing life and hope to many, rather than AIDS, sickness, despair, and death, which we had known up until that point. He had a hand in the R&D of absolutely every antiretroviral drug. And of course, very importantly, the advocacy towards universal access. I bring great um, uh, wishes, particularly to Dori, the family, and to all of you from the International Aid Society and, and on behalf of the 13,000 um, members of the International Aid Society. The success of treatment access uh, really played out from 2000. And here you see as the pie chart becomes more colorful, we see antiretrovirals moving into absolutely every part of the world. Again, David's role, and now I bring uh, good wishes from uh, Southern Africa, where the Kirby Institute has also played an important role. And this, uh, these uh, wishes come in particular from the Desmond Tutu HIV AIDS Foundation, where we have been involved uh, through a number of different clinical trials with the group here. And the team said David's contribution is an extraordinary act of both practical and intellectual generosity that has touched patients, academics, and communities in developing countries and worldwide. Um, and, and certainly, that is how we feel at the tip of Africa. There has also been a fantastic promise of prevention in art, and no, none more so than in the prevention of mother-to-child transmission. But even there, our work is not done. Whilst we are well on our way towards the eradication of mother-to-child, countries such as Nigeria, where there is still an enormous amount of work to be done in terms of curtailing even this, which seems to be uh, perhaps the one urgent and very critical aspect of the epidemic that really does need to come to an end. What about the rest of treatment in terms of its promise of prevention? And we're all very familiar now with these fast track targets to 2020 and then 2030 with the hope of really reducing infection uh, by getting treatment out there. And we're doing reasonably well. So um, uh, uh, coming into 21, 22 million people now on treatment, we are not there yet. And um, in terms of that 90-90-90 target, you see across the globe, 70%, 77%, and 82%. Many would argue that this means there is still a long road ahead. 7.5 million to go, 10.2 million to go, 10.8 million to go. And you see in the red bars, those regions of the world where we're doing less well. Western um, Africa, Central Africa, and of course the Eastern Europe and Central Asian region. And if we do actually believe that we should leave no one behind and go for 100, 100, 100, then there are still 18 million people to find, to start, and to suppress. Most of them, as you know, living uh, the region where I live, uh, the African regions, which are the most affected, and certainly uh, do deserve a great deal of, of the world's attention and the world's resources in order to curtail the epidemic. But I do want to draw your attention to those regions of the world who, that seem to have been forgotten. Here you see the Eastern Europe, Central Asia region, where in fact only 63% have been found, 29% are on treatment, and 22% virally suppressed. The vast majority uh, coming from Russia. And you see that in this region of the world, we have not yet begun to see the curve dipping for deaths. So as we reflect on the fact that we aren't yet at the 1990-90, and perhaps with just one and a half years to go before um, the 2020 target, the likelihood of actually getting there uh, begins to uh, maybe concern us, we also have to be aware that this can not only be about how fast, but also how well. And it is important that that last 90 is realized, if indeed we are going to make a difference to mortality and ultimately to prevention. 
And that raises this question, which I think was very dear to David's heart, of differentiated care. Care that is client-centered, it meets the needs of people, and uh, really reduces unnecessary burden on the health system. So differentiated care, a very strong priority of the International Aid Society, and one that we are uh, working hard to move around the world uh, as much as possible. And this uh, publication brings home that it is not just about treatment, but also about prevention. So it goes across the whole HIV care continuum, all the way from prevention through to differentiated art delivery. Again, touching on the issues there, an enabling environment, a robust drug supply, laboratory monitoring that includes viral load and recognizes the role of lay workers and communities in, in realizing these. So this is my first Cooperism, number one, that care isn't patient-centered without a viral load, without a complete approach. And so as we think of this narrative around 1990 and perhaps a somewhat triumphant narrative, at the IAS we, we feel very strongly that the narrative is out of sync with much of the realities of the world and we need to face some uncomfortable questions about it. Uh, in the next month, this harrowing publication will come from science that speaks about three regions in particular, Nigeria, um, uh, the, the Russian situation, and surprisingly, Miami and Florida. The, the tagline is, the tools exist, HIV AIDS can be treated and contained, but in many communities, social, political, and economic obstacles get in the way. There, the epidemic is far from over. And we know that last year, UNAIDS told us there was almost two million new infections around the world. That's about 5,000 every day. We will not end the epidemic alone with a 90-90-90 approach. We also need a new focus on primary prevention to reduce new infections, especially amongst uh, key populations, the youth, in the face of a bulging youth population. And this is starkly shown in this graph, which shows a 60% increase in new infections in Eastern Europe and Central Asia that in fact uh, has been on the upcrease since uh, 2010. So Cooperism number two is we won't treat our way out of this epidemic. We haven't eradicated TB and syphilis, and those are both curable. And, and just to illustrate that, we looked in two, in 2010 at the Cape Town TB epidemic, compared it to New York 100 years before, and looked at 100 years across both TB and New York. And you see in the blue bars how TB rates came down year on year in, in New York long before antibiotics were ever uh, discovered, streptomycin being discovered in 1950. And in the orange line, the Cape Townian TB epidemic, we notify more TB from Cape Town every year than the whole of Europe and America put together. Um, and you can see, despite really very good cure rates and directly observed therapy, we have never come out of a generalized TB, TB epidemic. So really to bring home David's concern that just relying on treatment perhaps is not uh, sufficient. So with 1.8 million new infections in young populations globally, it makes sense that we concentrate on young people. There are 26 new HIV infections among adolescents aged 15 to 19 every hour. Almost 40% of them occurring amongst adolescents outside of the sub-Saharan African region. But we also know we're moving towards this time of a youth bulge, we, we will see an incredible increase of young people in sub-Saharan Africa. One in four young people will live in Africa within the next 10 to 20 years. Young women and adolescent girls account for 75% of new HIV infections in sub-Saharan Africa. And 8,600 young women are infected on the continent every week. And we know the reasons why. Young women have low levels of school completion, 
They're given inadequate information. They're high levels of gender-based violence, poor access to sexual reproductive health services, poor social protection, tons of stigma and prejudice, early marriage, patriarchy, and older male partners, to name just a few. We also don't want to take our focus off young adolescents around the world who may use and inject drugs, who may go into uh, sex work, who may be young men who have sex with men. We know that risks are so much higher in each of those populations, as well as transgender people, incarcerated people, young refugees, migrants, and detainees around the world. We know that if we're not going to leave anyone behind, we have to think of these key populations. In, in regions outside of sub-Saharan sub Africa, these 80% of new infections are made up by key populations. My definition for that being particularly burdened populations who have poor access to services. Um, in, in my region, uh, as noted, 25% uh, of our new infections come from key populations. So even within generalized epidemics, we have to be aware of these special populations and know how to reach out to them. And, and again, uh, focusing in Eastern Europe and Central Asia, key populations, sex workers, people who inject drugs, young MSM uh, are very important uh, for our focus. Again, the drivers here being poor information, inadequate services, huge amounts of stigma and prejudice, criminalization, poor social protection, violence, and incarceration. Francois Barrier Suisi said, the scientists have developed an array of effective tools which, if implemented, could reverse the AIDS epidemic. Why then, despite this amazing array of, of innovation, why is prevention falling behind? Well, I would say, Perhaps one of the main reasons is politics. When we have strong national commitment, robust international support, and science guiding the process, then the response moves forward. When there is poor political commitment, rapid donor transition or donors moving out of an area, inadequate resourcing and criminalization, as well as ideology, being allowed to outweigh the science, then the response regresses. And I would argue, ladies and gentlemen, that if the AIDS response is not moving forward, then it is sliding backwards. There is no stagnation. So Cooperism number three is, it will take science, clinical, community, and activism to get it done. And that, I think, is encompassed within politics. Yet few countries have consistently applied a combination prevention approach which provides packages of services tailored to priority populations within specific local context. And I'm pleased to say that I think I'm standing in an area where this actually has been applied. And, and it's been fantastic to see the progress that has happened here in New South Wales, particularly of late with the addition of PrEP, to see those numbers uh, turning around. So congratulations, and I'm very pleased to hear that PrEP is now on the essential drug list. Notably, and it is always important to note, um, and I'm, I'm quoting from this publication, these declines were not seen in migrant and indigenous populations. So again, focus on, on special populations. So our approach needs to be one of a tailored, client-centered, uh, specific package for the population that is administered in an accessible, layered, integrated way that takes into consideration social justice, human rights, and a legal framework within a community envelope. And there are other examples. So what has happened in Vancouver in the uh, drug-using population there, I think, is, is again, uh, inspirational to all of us, um, where there was a, a, an amazing prevention initiative uh, driven on by political will and access to resources. Important, the, the role that uh, harm reduction plays in this epidemic around the world. But because of bad policies that reflect ideology and bias rather than science, those most vulnerable to HIV are deterred from accessing the services they need. 
Another illustrative example is, is that from San Francisco, where a, a city where they are quickly moving to zero new infections. And this has been, again, large-scale access, promotion to HIV testing, the promotion of treatment, and the introduction of, of wide-scale PrEP, together with strong political and local government support. Finally, London, uh, where we've seen an 80% fall in new HIV diagnosis um, amongst uh, sexual health clinic populations, again, driven by extraordinary efforts to get hold of PrEP, uh, together with good treatment and sexual health care, uh, in a country which has not yet embraced PrEP for everyone. Uh, we know that it's very important that uh, the environment in which people find their services are really critical, and many of you will know that in many parts of, of the world, uh, these special populations are criminalized, not least MSM on the uh, African subcontinent. There are other challenges on a political front. I, I would be remiss if I did not allude to uh, ideologies uh, that lead to policies such as the global gag rule uh, that really undermine our efforts to provide uh, comprehensive care in which HIV can be overcome. Clinics face an excruciating choice if they do what science and human rights require and provide comprehensive sexual re reproductive health services and then run the risk of not being able uh, to be funded. So Cooperism number three is science should drive our response. Politics and ideology can't get in the way. Politics should enable, not undermine. And here's a lovely example of how important this is. Uh, again, looking at sex workers now in India, where despite illegality of brothels and large-scale stigma and discrimination, 82% of sex workers have been reached by HIV prevention programs and HIV prevalence in sex workers here is steadily declining, showing the importance of community leadership and participation. Cooperism number five is we need a vaccine and a cure. And Coops, I would agree, this is really important, but what can we be doing in the meantime? We have some tools, uh, we can be applying them. So why, again I ask, is prevention falling behind? Well, I would argue political leaders lack courage to tackle questions that effective HIV prevention raises. So criminalization and discrimination of key populations still rife around the world. 70 countries still criminalize same-sex relationships. Criminalization of HIV non-disclosure, exposure or transmission. 72 countries still specifically allow for this. Evidence-based harm reduction approaches for injecting drug users is not the norm. Incarcerated populations are underserved. Harmful gender norms, gender-based violence, patriarchy and poor social protection again occur in too many countries around the world. Inadequate comprehensive sexual health education and adolescent friendly services for youth, another priority. And that brings me to the last of my points and that is around the funding gap. So the other reason is that of resources. And we know that uh, we have a funding gap for treatment and prevention to the order of 26 uh, billion US dollars that needs to be found by 2020 if we are going to meet the fast track targets, um, and that would require about 1.5 million US to be added to the budget annually. We are not meeting those targets. And as we all know, when countries have to make a decision between treatment or prevention, high-income countries can often come with both, uh, but those countries that have restrained resources have to make an excruciating choice and treatment um, not unexpectedly often wins. So the investment in prevention is falling as funding for AIDS stagnates. The total donor government disbursements fell about 20% in the last few years. Resources for HIV programs in low to middle income countries fell 77%. Uh, philanthropy happily has increased and domestic investment uh, is 
uh, the largest proportion and growing, but that rate of growth also worryingly has just recently slowed down. Prioritization of low-income or high-burden countries risk leaving concentrated epidemics or epidemics amongst key populations in middle to high-income countries or low-burden countries behind, and transitioning out of donors in countries where key population groups are criminalized or stigmatized can leave behind a very critical vacuum, because obviously domestic services do not or will not fill that gap. And here's an example of Romania a country that transitioned from low to middle income, not considered in the global fund definition of worthy of, of, um, of funding. So the global fund withdrew in 2010, and you see this extraordinary increase of HIV prevalence in the injecting community in Romania over a short three-year period. So how do we ensure countries outside of sub-Saharan Africa also get the support they need. And this remains a conundrum for all of us. Prevention efforts remain chronically underfunded worldwide. Funding critically is needed for community mobilization, interpersonal communications, assistance with adherence. These elements are required to make large-scale treatment and prevention programs have a meaningful impact. Number four is we this can't be done without community, resources, and activism. Community empowerment and other programs that have been proven to reduce stigma, discrimination, and marginalization, including health clinics, have not been properly resourced nor brought to scale. Gains are being made in generalized populations, but there is an alarming shift in disease burden towards key populations. We cannot afford to leave them behind. I would ask, are we ready to embrace new approaches, such as integrating HIV into a broader healthcare arena? And I'm pleased to say that we will, in Amsterdam, the IAS, together with the Lancet, be um, launching a commission we've been working on for the last two years that looks to advance global health and strengthen the HIV response in the SDG era. It uh, really looks to find a new era of global solidarity for health, finding the common cause between HIV and broader global health. And I urge you to look out for that commission, even if you aren't able to join us in Amsterdam. I do believe this is a new era that we need to embrace and take forward. So I'll end. What I've just been describing is uh, contained within the 2018 annual letter from the IAS. And we end with uh, six main commitments uh, that we bring to the global world. First of all, that we will link HIV with a broader global health agenda. We will push science wherever we can, unite inter interdisciplinary scientists, community advocates, and frontline healthcare workers, invest in prevention, make groundbreaking HIV research available, and make money work for a people-centered healthcare approach. I'll end uh, again by acknowledging, uh, of course, David, our hero, but the Cooper family as well, who, who stand uh, with us, I believe, in, in, in voicing this comment. We fought the war on drugs for access to medication. Now we need to keep going. We must refuse to declare victory until AIDS is ended for all populations. We cannot leave anyone behind. Thank you.